Good morning and uh, welcome to the people who are watching on video today, the live streaming. I'm Tim Gaylard and I'm going to be uh, introducing the course that we're doing here on campus uh, on George Gershwin and I'm, today is the first lecture. So today is obviously a good time to sort of introduce the man and his music and get to know a little more about him in terms of his life and his career and then to listen to a sampling of some of his music and especially some pieces that I've discovered have become part of our American culture. That is some pieces that you may uh, see on commercials, uh, in the movies, and also cover a few of the different genres that Gershwin wrote. Uh, I've often thought of Gershwin as the American Mozart uh, and that analogy can be taken only so far but certainly one of the things that we note about Gershwin is that he had a short life like Mozart and yet in his short life wrote an incredible amount of music. Uh, there are other tangential points I think that I will make reference to as we get into our discussion but I wanted to start with a discussion of his life uh, looking at the man, looking at the important people in his life uh, and certainly looking at the gradual development of his career if you like the the seven stages in this case of George Gershwin's life. And I, I'm going to start with a PowerPoint uh, just to give us some images and allow me to discuss some of these ideas and people and places and uh, various uh, aspects of his career. Uh, so uh, let's get started with uh, the, the idea that Gershwin is one of the most versatile uh, composers in American history. We think of him in terms of many different styles of music, uh, being able to master many different genres and various different idioms in music. Uh, we then often compare him to Mozart in that way, who was able to write for the voice, was able to write for the piano, was able to write for instruments. This is also true of Gershwin. We think of his great songs, we think of his piano pieces, we think of his orchestral pieces, uh, we think of his shows, uh, his operettas, and of course his, his great masterpiece, uh, Porgy and Bess. Now, what are, what are the origins of Gershwin? Where does he come from? Well, one thing that we need to remember about Gershwin is that he is a man of the city. He is, uh, I think, the, the adjective that best describes him is urbane. Uh, urbane in that he was sophisticated, he was elegant, uh, he was a man of the city. And indeed, as you can see, he was born in Brooklyn, although his father, who was a businessman and somebody who tried various different businesses, by the way, before anything really stuck, he owned restaurants, he owned bakeries, he owned a Turkish bath for a while. Uh, Morris Gershwin moved the family around a great deal when Gershwin was growing up. So indeed, even though he was born in Brooklyn, he lived in various locations throughout New York City uh, in his first uh, years. And even when he became famous and, uh, and was able to afford very expensive uh, apartments, they were all in New York City. So we tend to think of Gershwin as the ultimate New York composer. Uh, we also think of him as being a very ambitious uh, person, somebody who had the ambition to succeed uh, in the music world, even though he had not really ever finished a high school. He decided to go into the commercial world of music at the age of 15. And in that time, the commercial world of music was called Tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley is named for the fact that the pianos that were heard on the street in, tin, in that area of New York, 28th Street, uh, were sounding like tin pans. That was why it was called Tin Pan Alley. Uh, and 28th Street was the location of various publishing houses for music. The, the music industry, of course, was uh, very reliant on the aspect of selling the music that was being heard and played in the theaters of New York. Uh, a lot of those pieces were starting to be heard in recordings. And various people wanted to buy music, so publishing <coughs> companies emerged to provide that market. 
And we have to remember that Gershwin really started in the commercial world of music. He, he grew up learning how to sell music, how to make music popular. And indeed, he started as a song plugger. A song plugger was a pianist who would be hired by the publishing company to play in a room in the, in the uh, company's uh, location and sort of promote songs to various people who may have been performers on Broadway who were hoping to maybe find a, a song to perform there. Uh, various uh, buyers who were interested in using songs in shows, uh, directors, people like that. And so Gershwin became well known as a song plugger in the uh, Tin Pan Alley area of New York. So much so that many people decided they should go and hear a song as played by Gershwin. Because what happened, he wasn't playing his own music, he was playing other people's songs. He was apparently ragging them up. He was changing them. He wasn't always playing what was written on the page. What we sometimes associate with what jazz musicians do. And so we find Gershwin employing these techniques at a very early age. Now many people wonder, well, where did he get his training? He did study uh, as a young boy with some classical teachers. He did learn the, some of the classical pieces. Uh, he did know the music of Chopin and Liszt and Debussy. He often cites them as influences on his music. But he also was interested in American popular music. And the problem he found was his classical music teachers didn't always know how to deal with that side of his, his musical interest. He was somebody who therefore went out, because he was in the city, he went and listened to performers in the city to learn how they did it through, through his ear. So one of the things we often think about with Gershwin is how much of an autodidact he was. Even though he had some classical training, he did throughout his life go to classical uh, teachers for uh, extra lessons in orchestration and in musical form and structure. But so much of what we gather is Gershwin's uh, persona is somebody who is self-taught, somebody who is trying to figure out how music works, especially in the popular world. Uh, and for that reason, he was interested in music beyond what his teachers could teach him. And, and in particular, as I say, this music of the, uh, the popular world and the rising importance of what we call jazz. The, uh, keep in mind, if you look at his dates, he's living at a time when ragtime piano becomes very popular. He's living at a time when the, the jo rags of Scott Joplin in particular have become a sensational uh, hit. Uh, then he, those uh, are followed by people like James P. Johnson and uh, Jelly Roll Morton and people who are playing this music and jazzing up this ragtime style and turning it into more improvised style that we think of as jazz. Tin Pan Alley, of course, is very close to Broadway. So it's not surprising that so many people that he came in contact with as a teenager, as a young musician, were with Broadway performers, Broadway directors, people who had positions of power, people who were able to help him. Gradually, of course, he was writing his own songs, and he started to promote his own music. Uh, and got some songs inserted into various shows on Broadway. Uh, we have uh, him also being hired by George White to write songs for these shows that were sort of reviews, uh, the scandals of George Wright, White in uh, the early 1920s. Uh, of course, the big breakthrough in Gershwin's career came because of Al Jolson, who heard Gershwin's song, Swanee, and decided to perform it in a show called The Capitol Review. And in 1919, that song suddenly became a huge hit. Uh, Jolson recorded the song, and then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to buy the recordings, and more important, they wanted to buy the music. And so Gershwin, at the age just almost 21, became a household name. He became a famous composer of popular songs. 
And so in that year, 1919, was the, also the first year that Gershwin was hired uh, to write a complete show for Broadway. It was called Lala Lucille. So we have Gershwin starting to establish his career as a popular song composer, as a composer for the Broadway musicals, uh, and the musicals, it might be not the right word for this stage of Broadway, more like musical reviews very often, uh, variety shows, uh, as well as a couple of shows that were more uh, integrated uh, dramatically. But we always feel that Gershwin had this ambition to go beyond the world of popular music. Uh, and keep in mind that he did know classical music. We know that when he was a young man, he attended many concerts in the city. It's such a rich city, of course, there's the great concert halls in, in the city, Carnegie Hall, the most famous. He, we do have programs that show that he was interested in classical music, that he attended very famous performers uh, who played the, the traditional classics. We also know that his father uh, had a taste in music. Uh, his father, of course, was a Russian immigrant. Uh, he was somebody who uh, knew the European tradition. He had recordings at home. So Gershwin did hear music uh, in his home, and he was aware of opera, he was aware of, of symphonies, he was aware of concertos, uh, and he was somebody who thought, I can do this too, I can write this sort of music. And it so happened that uh, we need to, uh, be, uh, by the way, we need to bring in uh, another very important person in his life, and that is Ira Gershwin, his older brother, uh, who is, if you like, his, his partner uh, very often in his later work. Uh, I've mentioned the Broadway musicals that he started to write, the Broadway shows. Of course, Ira started to write the lyrics for the songs that Gershwin wrote. At the beginning of their careers, uh, Ira didn't want to appear to be part of the Gershwin um, legend, so he actually used a pseudonym for a while of his, uh, their younger siblings. And many people aren't aware that the Gershwin family consisted of four children. Ira and George were the eldest, but there were two other children. And when Ira didn't want to be known as a Gershwin, he called himself Arthur Francis. Arthur Francis were the first names of the siblings, of so the two brothers. Later on, of course, it became George and Ira Gershwin, and we, we do have uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, unity of, of, the, of the name. But in the early years, sometimes you'll see a song that was published, and it will say lyrics by Arthur Francis. Well, that's really Ira Gershwin. Uh, Ira Gershwin had a great talent for writing words. He was more bookish. He was very much a, a contrast to his brother, who was very sort of outgoing, energetic, uh, full of, of, of the desire to succeed. Uh, his brother was more laid back. Uh, but perhaps uh, the, the rock in Gershwin's life, George's life, that he needed. His brother was reliable. Uh, he was somebody somewhat self-effacing. There's stories of them being at parties where George was playing the piano all night and Ira was just sitting in the background smoking his uh, pipe and, and enjoying the, the adulation that his brother was receiving. But we must emphasize that without Ira, I think George Gershwin's music would not be nearly as powerful and as, as memorable because of the great words that Ira provided for those songs uh, that Gershwin wrote. So we have Ira Gershwin, and they had their first big hit in 1924 with a show called Lady Be Good. So uh, they indeed started a series of great successes on Broadway with that show. <clears throat> And one of the important stars of that show was Fred Astaire. Uh, Fred Astaire had actually been visiting Gershwin even in the earlier years uh, when Fred Astaire was starting off his career and looking for songs to sing by going to Tin Pan Alley and hearing the young Gershwin and being impressed with his talent. So the, uh, the association of Fred Astaire with Gershwin is a very long one, a very interesting one, because it starts in Broadway. Fred Astaire, of course, at that day, day in the early 1920s, uh, was paired with his sister Adele. Uh, they were famous sort of dancing team. Of course, we think of Fred Astaire still as a great dancer, but he was a singer. He was also an actor. And as we will see, eventually Fred Astaire 
ended up in Hollywood. And of course, more famously, uh, made films with Ginger Rogers in those wonderful movie musicals of the late 1930s. And one of those musicals, in fact, movie musicals, was written by Gershwin. So we will uh, come back to the association with the stare. But this is a very important performer, if you like, in Gershwin's life, and somebody who helped to promote his music. And if anybody is a big Fred Astaire fan out there, you probably have albums where Fred Astaire is singing many of the standard songs by Gershwin. I think he's, he's very much associated with this composer. Uh, the big change in Gershwin's career, of course, came in 1924 because I've mentioned the George White scandals. The conductor for the George White scandals uh, was Paul Whiteman. And Paul Whiteman was a famous band director who saw Gershwin's talent, liked a lot of his songs, but he was also in charge of an orchestra, or a band if you like, that played uh, jazzed up versions, if you like, swung versions of popular songs, even popular classical pieces. And he asked Gershwin to write uh, a piece of music for his band that would feature a piano solo. And of course, that was what was the Rhapsody in Blue. Uh, the Rhapsody in Blue, written in 1924, and which was premiered in a hall which unfortunately no longer exists, the Aeolian Hall in New York City. And with the Rhapsody in Blue, Gershwin sort of suddenly burst into the classical world, so to speak, by writing a piece that was for piano and orchestra, a one-movement piano concerto. Later on today, you will hear more about that piece, so I'm not going to spend too much time with, with it now. But it's a piece that continues, and maybe at that time, certainly uh, challenged critics and audiences about what exactly it was. Was it a classical piece? Was it a jazz piece? Was it full of popular hit tunes? Does it really matter? It's a wonderful piece of music. And we will sample some of it a little later in this lecture. But it is a piece that sort of shook up the classical world in a bit, in a way, because so much music in the classical tradition, of course, had been European. There was a certain style associated with that tradition. And Gershwin added all these elements that were clearly derived from other sources, uh, clearly American sources. <laughs> uh, the next year, because of the success of Rhapsody in Blue, he was commissioned by Walter Damrosch, the conductor of the New York Symphony, to write a piece for piano and orchestra, a full-fledged piano concerto, which I will be talking about tomorrow. And that was ha had its premiere in Carnegie Hall. Uh, and indeed, Carnegie Hall is considered the, the epitome of where a classical mu composer or a musician would, would actually be, be heard. So this was a tremendous jump for Gershwin to go from Tin Pan Alley and the Broadway musical theaters into the concert hall, especially Carnegie Hall. Uh, this is the site not only of the premiere of the uh, Piano Concerto in F, but also of An American in Paris in 1928, his orchestral tone poem, which again will be discussed uh, later this week. And we have uh, this interesting uh, challenge, I think, that Gor Gershwin gives that I'm a popular composer, I'm a song composer, I've been writing great hits in Tin Pan Alley, but I can also write worthy works and long works in the classical genres in the classical tradition. This is something that, again, caused some eyebrows to rise and some, some people to say, does Gershwin really belong here? Uh, there is a certain uh, skepticism you read in the critics of that time about Gershwin's popularity and his, uh, whether, whether he should, should be composing this type of music. I think there's, there's a musical snobbery that certainly existed then. It still exists somewhat today, but there is th that sense that in that period, the, the, the barrier between the popular and the classical, right? This, this is something Gershwin is challenging with his, his, his music. Breaking down barriers, if you've got the outline in front of you, uh, this is what I'm referring to here. 
So let's look at some of the other uh, people in Gershwin's life. People often wonder about his, his love life. Uh, he was apparently very popular with the ladies, especially once he became successful, was making lots of money. Uh, he was a relatively handsome man. Uh, he was a talented person. It's not any surprise that when he went to parties that many women uh, were attracted to him. But the one person that was important in his life was Kay Swift, who it was a musician, a very, very talented woman, uh, somebody who was classically trained, who knew a lot about music. Unfortunately, she was married. <coughs> uh, she was married to a, a very rich businessman. Uh, and it was because of her affair with Gershwin that she divorced her husband. And there's been a lot of speculation about why Kay Swift and Gershwin did not marry. It's believed that because he went off to Hollywood in 1936, that he was going to maybe propose to her once he came back to New York. And of course, he never did come back to New York. So uh, Kay Swift is somebody who is important as a source about Gershwin. And she is somebody who uh, actually remembers some of the tunes that Gershwin had played on the piano and never wrote down. So she is also responsible for giving us some musical material that we wouldn't otherwise have. And uh, Kay Swift, as I say, uh, is somebody who was really a woman he considered his musical equal. Uh, apparently, they listened to music together quite a lot. Uh, and she said, I think uh, a great quote was, he was a wonderful listener when, when they did that together. <clears throat> now, we have to remember that the 20s, the Roaring Twenties, was often called the Jazz Age. And so many of the shows that we hear in Ger uh, Ger in the, from Gershwin in the 20s are uh, tinged with that dynamic, that vibrant, that uh, uh, element of, of uh, of free uh, living and, uh, the, 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 of course, the age of prohibition and, and the era of the Great Gatsby, so to speak. That is all, I think, reflected in Gershwin's sound, the, the style and, and the character of his music. But also in 1929 comes the crash, and there's a new sort of uh, feeling in the 1930s, I think very much reflected by one of his later shows of the I Sing, and its sequel, Let Them Eat Cake, which are both actually social parodies and political parodies. Uh, and Avdi I Sing was so successful that it won a Pulitzer Prize. Again, later this week, we will hear more about that piece. But it is a, a piece that has a certain bite to it that I think uh, also reflects maybe Ira's cynicism about the world, especially the world of politics. <clears throat> We can't talk about Gershwin without, of course, mentioning his great ambition to write the American opera. And there were many subjects he thought about. Uh, being, being Jewish, he thought about the Dibuk uh, story. But he eventually settled on his fascination with the African American uh, life and the music of the African American people. And so he became uh, enamored of a novel by DuBose Hayward, Porgy, which became the basis, of course, of his great opera, Porgy and Bess, what he called his folk opera. He spent two years of his life working on this work, knowing that it probably would never have the financial rewards of one of his shows, but he wanted to write this piece, and I think what he gave us is probably one of the great operas of all time, and certainly perhaps the great American opera. It's hard to think of any other American work that has the durability and the uh, depth of, of emotion of this, this work. Again, it's a hard work to classify, and even from the very beginning, it didn't really work in the operatic world and yet it didn't somehow work in the world of Broadway either, and therefore had to be adapted to belong to the Broadway world. Uh, there were other issues at that time which stood in the way of it being produced as an opera, say at the Metropolitan Opera, and that is that the Gershwins insisted that all the characters be sung by uh, African Americans, and at that time there was a racial barrier at the Metropolitan Opera. So we will again hear more about that work on Wednesday, 
and discuss its significance in Gershwin's career, but also in the history of American opera. And it is also a controversial work that I think uh, some aspects of this work need to also be looked at. <clears throat> I've already, uh, of course, here the great uh, singers, the first performers in Porgy and Bess, were both classically trained singers, Todd Duncan and Anne Brown. And they, of course, left their mark on this work, but have been succeeded by many other great African-American performers in these two roles. <clears throat> the final years where Gershwin and his brother ended up because of the lucrative nature of the Hollywood business, were, of course, was in California. Uh, they had been out briefly in 1930, 31, for a movie called Delicious, but then they came back in 1936 and wrote a, a musical, a movie musical for Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, which is Shall We Dance? Uh, they stayed on to write two more uh, scores for the movies. Uh, in Damsel in Distress, and also this one, The Goldwyn Follies, which actually came out after Gershwin died. This film came out in 1938. Uh, as you know, if you see your dates here, Gershwin died in 37. But these last movies contain some of Gershwin's greatest song hits, and I believe later this morning we may hear a sampling of some of that. And I will give you uh, one of those songs uh, in a moment as we get to the discussion of uh, his music. Just to summarize, the, uh, the career of Gershwin, the early life in New York, uh, the childhood studies with classical uh, composers and uh, piano teachers, uh, then the work is after he drops out of high school as a song plugger, starts to write his own songs, starts to get his works published, then the early successes in Broadway with the scandals, uh, with Al Jolson's singing of Swanee. Uh, and then we have, of course, the big breakthrough, the concert piece, the Rhapsody in Blue, which is followed by the Concerto in F and American in Paris. And many other pieces, by the way, not as well known, but the pieces like the second Rhapsody and the uh, variations on I Got Rhythm for piano and orchestra, and a piece that you will hear tonight, the Cuban Overture, often known as the Rumba, which is also written for orchestra. Uh, then, then we have, during that same time, uh, very important Broadway musicals written with his brother, uh, Lady Be Good, I mentioned already, but Funny Face is another one, uh, and uh, Girl Crazy, especially important in 1930. We have the era of the political satire, the uh, I Sing and Let Him Eat Cake in the 1930s, his first Hollywood visit. Uh, and then after that, he comes back and really starts to be obsessed with Porgy and Bess and writes for about three, three years, almost three years, on that great work, which is premiered at the end of 1935. Then he and his brother go out to Hollywood, and unfortunately, um, he starts to get headaches. Uh, he starts to get dizzy spells. People start to think, oh, he's just sort of too stressed. He needs to see a psychiatrist. So he, he starts to uh, get, get some therapy. Uh, not, any, not many people start to realize, in fact, he is physically ill. Uh, and it's too late when the doctors discover that he has a brain tumor. Uh, he dies under the operation in July of 1937, very tragically. And a big shock to the music world, a big shock to his brother, I think, who never really got over the death of, of George. But we have uh, this tragic loss, uh, as we think of with the death of Mozart, right? the early death of Mozart. Uh, and there is a wonderfully uh, moving memorial concert uh, given in Hollywood in September of 1937. And I hope to get to one performance from that uh, 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 event in a moment. So I want to go now to the music and the the idea of what is Gershwin's music, what, what does it have in it, what are some of the things we should know about his music, and the elements that sort of make up uh, his, his style. The, the thing that keeps coming up is the idea of how original he is, and how creative he is, how amazingly he puts the various elements that he's exposed to as an American, as a New Yorker, in the big city, 
and absorbs all those different styles and puts them into his creative work. The, the other is the, the popular element, that his music is very appealing. Uh, maybe because he was a man of commerce first, he knew the world of commercial music, he knew what would appeal to the general public. So there is an element of his music that is always quite uh, 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 enchanting and something that is, I think because of its emotional nature, very often grabs us in, in a very powerful way. Uh, the other element that often comes into play with his music is the driving element, this, this notion of the energy of the city, the restlessness uh, that is characteristic, I think, of his temperament. Uh, the next is the really important influence from African American music. I've mentioned ragtime, I've mentioned jazz, the blues, all of these things have a, a, an impact on Gershwin. He, he listened to this music, he, he went to hear performers in Harlem, he was some really uh, very much felt connected, I think, to the music of the African American people. Uh, perhaps being a minority himself, being Jewish, there is a sort of sense that he's identifying in a way, uh, but I think he's also fascinated by the musical sounds that he's hearing uh, from, from that aspect of American music. But we, we shouldn't also uh, limit ourselves to understanding him just through that, that alone. I think there is a Latin American influence, there is a, a French and British influence, there are certainly classical composers that we hear in his style. The uh, composers that he often cites are people like Stravinsky, of course a Russian, uh, but I think very often his romantic sort of side is uh, very closely related to Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. There is a style there that you might say is, is very sort of Russian romantic. Uh, he's fascinated by the orchestration and the colors of the French composer Debussy. So we will also hear, I think, a certain amount of Debussy uh, in his music. Uh, the influence, of course, of operetta on the American musical is, is something people often uh, uh, talk about. And it's true that sometimes Gershwin can even sound like Gilbert and Sullivan, or Jacques Offenbach, or even Johann Strauss, the great waltz king uh, uh, in Vienna. So all of these things, if there's a sort of melting pot. We, I, you know, as a Canadian, I was always told the Americans are a melting pot. This is, this is the, the aspect of Gershwin, I think, that fascinated me about him and his music. Now, I, I, I talk about the great, I'm going to talk about his great melodies, his colorful harmonies, his syncopated rhythms, which all these energy uh, we have in his music derived from that, those complex rhythmic patterning. Uh, we have the song-like aspect, the, the de dominance of one melody over an accompaniment that we call homophonic in musical terms. But Gershwin is also interested in the interweaving of various melodies at the same time, so there is some polyphonic style in his music. He is interested in structure, but he is also interested in freedom of structure and writing in a freer style. Rhapsody, of course, Rhapsody in Blue is a somewhat loose work, whereas the Concerto in F has a more strict uh, structural design. Uh, then there are the genres. We've talked about the, the musical reviews, the musical shows, the piano solo music. Keep in mind, he was a very fine pianist, so he wrote a fair amount of music for solo piano. Uh, there's the orchestra and piano, of course, the Rhapsody in Blue, the Concerto, uh, Second Rhapsody. There are the orchestral pieces, and there are the operas. There's a, a short opera called Blue Monday that was actually first performed in uh, a scandal show. Uh, Paul Whiteman was uh, somebody who thought it might work at the end of a show. Of course, it didn't really work. It was dropped fairly quickly. But it involves an African-American story. It's a sort of mini one-act opera. And it, in a way, is the forerunner to uh, Porgy and Bess uh, about a decade later. So it's an interesting work, if anybody's really into uh, all the work Gershwin works. Uh, check up on Blue Monday. Uh, which was redone uh, later as 135th Street. <clears throat> now, I've mentioned American pop culture, and you'll have to excuse me while I, I change over here to some examples of, of, um, from YouTube. And we're going to watch a couple of things. 
some of which I think you will recognize. <clears throat> Well, that is a very abbreviated version of Rhapsody in Blue, but United Airlines has actually bought the rights to use the uh, Rhapsody in Blue in their commercials uh, ever since the mid-1980s. In fact, that's a relatively uh, old commercial, uh, but it features the great, what is often called the love theme from Rhapsody in Blue, the, the, the theme that we've all been waiting for. So we have this, this wonderfully sweeping melody, uh, not unlike until there, uh, the uh, sound of Tchaikovsky or Rachmaninoff, right? There is this wonderful uh, flowing uh, melody uh, that is very much rooted in European uh, romanticism. But then Gershwin adds this. <laughs> That little sort of riff which comes from jazz and which starts to employ what we call the blues notes, right? So there is this interesting mix of the uh, traditional European uh, melody with an American element. Uh, I wanted to play another uh, United Airlines commercial that actually uses uh, a different part of the Rhapsody in Blue. you'd love to be on a plane with those guys. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the theme, which is often called the Ritornello theme. It's one of the main themes of, of the early part of the piece. And it's called Ritornello, a very snooty classical term derived from Baroque concerto. But it is this main theme. Now what's interesting about that, you actually hear it add as a great melody coming down, right? Right, this wonderful descent through uh, what we consider the blues scale. Right, the blues scale having the flattened seventh and sixth as well as the flattened third. 
Although a lot of people have noticed the Ritornello theme may have something in common with Jewish cantorial singing. There's a little bit of, of a little inflection. Which uh, in, in more recent scholars have said, you know, there is an impact perhaps of the Yiddish theater that, Jew, uh, that uh, Gershwin would have attended. His dad loved to go there uh, when he was growing up. Uh, he was not really a practicing uh, Jew, but he did uh, come in, into exposure with the Jewish tradition. Uh, they did have satyrs. They did, uh, they did have friends who were, who were obviously uh, singing in the synagogues. Uh, and so there is, as is, is often the case, an interesting cross-cultural uh, reference that may be going on here. Is it a Jewish influence or is it an African-American uh, sort of influence? Because there's some things that, I, I, in, in a way, paradoxically, these two traditions share uh, certain things. The thing that I love most about Gershwin is we hear that melody. And it's a wonderful tune. It's a tune you'll remember. But listen what happens. We put the harmony with it. If you just had traditional harmony, it could have been harmonized like this. What we call in music the primary chords of one, four, five. That's the basic structural harmonic structure of that that uh, underpinning to the melody. But this is what Gershwin adds. And what's he adding? He's adding all these wonderful chromatic chords. Next one. Chromatic meaning moving by half step in music moving from one pitch to the very closest pitch. On the piano, it's very often from the white note to the next black note, right? So we have this chromaticism, and the bluesiness of the uh, melody is also invading the harmonic accompaniment. So we put the two together. And that is, to me, the magic of Gershwin, the, the way that he uses harmony to color his wonderful melodies. Now, we often also hear Gershwin's music in, in movies. Uh, and one that I should not uh, leave out is, of course, this movie, uh, Woody Allen's Manhattan. <coughs> This is the very opening of Manhattan. Chapter one. He adored New York City. He idolized it all out of proportion. Uh, no, make that, he, he romanticized it all out of proportion. Yeah. To him, no matter what the season was, this was still a town that existed in black and white and pulsated to the great tunes of George Gershwin. Uh, now let me stop this one. Chapter one. He was too romantic about Manhattan, as he was about everything else. He thrived on the hustle bustle of the crowds and the traffic. To him, New York meant beautiful women and street smart guys who seemed to know all the angles. Ah, corny, too corny for it. Taste to me, me, Chapter one. He adored New York City. To him, it was a metaphor for the decay of contemporary culture. The same lack of individual integrity that caused so many people to take the easy way out was rapidly turning the town of his dreams. It's going to be too preachy. I mean, you know, it's best. <laughs> Chapter one. He adored New York City. Although to him, it was a metaphor for the decay of contemporary culture. How hard it was to exist in a society desensitized by drugs, loud music, television, crime, garbage. <laughs> Too angry. I don't want to be angry. <laughs> it was as tough and romantic as the city he loved. Behind his black rimmed glasses was the coiled sexual power of a jungle cat. 
New York was his town, and it always would be. Well, of course, that's uh, Woody Allen, the ultimate New York director, using the music of George Gershwin for the city that he loves so much. And it was interesting, Woody Allen had to get permission from the Gershwin family. Ira was apparently still alive at that point, so he said, well, as long as you use more than just the Rhapsody in Blues. So the rest of the movie, if, if you do not know the movie, this is a good movie filled with Gershwin's music, and it is, uh, of course, a, a very funny story. It's interesting, when I first went to New York as a grad student at Columbia, uh, this film came out, and I thought, this is so interesting, I've come to the city, I went to see the movie in the city, and hearing Gershwin, of course, the whole, it made such a tremendous impact on, on me in 1977. The uh, other films that have used, and there have been many, uh, one, uh, one that is fondly uh, remember too is uh, when Hallie met Sari, uh, Sally, sorry, um, <clears throat> and we have very young Billy Crystal here. Here, sung by Louis Armstrong. I'm sure you recognize the sound of Louis Armstrong's voice. Let's call the whole thing off. There's Washington Square again. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are also the Twin Towers in the, framed by the, the arch. This movie, of course, is Again, uh, it sets up the story. They clearly don't like each other at this point. Uh, but uh, there is, of course, a story to be told after that. But the uh, Gershwin song seems very appropriate. I've given you the text in your uh, uh, outline here. You, you say either, I say either. It's a song I think Scott and Amy are going to sing for you tonight. So um, that is something. And then the, the other movie that uh, for a while was very popular with, with young people um, is Mr. Holland's opus, uh, where we have, of course, several Gershwin songs again being featured. <clears throat> uh, Richard Dreyfuss and Jean Louisa Kelly here. Uh, there is an all Gershwin program that Mr. Holland decides to conduct at the school. And this young girl, Rowena, sings one of the great standards by Gershwin. So I'm going to seek a certain land. I've had a dream of a Looking everywhere, haven't found him yet. He's the big affair I cannot forget. Only man I ever think of with. I'm going to move to the And she has a crush on her teacher, of course that's part of the story of this. So again, the, the magic of the Gershwin song uh, with uh, 
let's call the whole thing off. You have, you, you say either and I say either. What makes that so memorable is it's very repetitive, right? It has sort of one little melodic riff that gets repeated over and over again and then a beautifully constructed song. People really love to analyze the Gershwin songs because of the way the melodic uh, design unfolds. And of course along with that is the rhythmic energy. So we get also this impetus through the uh, rhythmic syncopation in the music, not always accenting one, two, three, four, as we would have in a traditional uh, classical piece perhaps, but accenting between the two and the three. So these are things that are derived, of course, from his interest in uh, ragtime in, in jazz. The other piece though, which is of course a more like a ballad, a very beautiful lyrical melody, right? very smooth, a beautiful arch going up. Someone to watch over me. And then, as is always the case with Gershwin, is the magic of the harmony. What we have here is a series of what we call diminished seventh chords. Right. And then, of course, the refrain. Uh, the, uh, the style of his music does change, but it has very often the same sort of elements uh, interwoven uh, in his, his uh, music. And, and again, many of this, the craft of his music in the, in the song is reflected also in the craft of his more serious music. The, uh, the works of, of the of pieces like Porgy and Bass. I wanted to uh, play a little bit uh, of his uh, opera, where at the end of the opera, uh, Porgy comes back after being put in jail for a while, and while he's gone, uh, Bess has left uh, with the drug dealer sporting life. Sorry. I wish we could hear more, but we will hear it sung later uh, today. Um, <clears throat> that melody, such a beautiful melody, uh, becomes part of a trio. That is, Maria and Serena tell him, oh, you're well done with Bess. She was no good for you. She's gone off with sport in life. She's just a drug, drug addicted woman. You, you, you're well rid of her. Uh, and they sing really a trio, uh, what in operatic terms means that three characters are singing different thoughts at the same time with very different melodies. Uh, and I always think this is a wonderful indication of Gershwin's gift for polyphony, the interweaving of various different uh, melodies uh, coinciding uh, and blending in an incredible way uh, harmonically. But let me just play you the top parts.
and so on, we get uh, these two women singing counter melodies over the melody we've already heard Porgy sing alone. This is what we're coming up to, the polyphony of these three voices. <clears throat> Some people have even likened this great trio at the end of Porgy and Bess to the trio uh, at the end of Rosencavalier by Richard Strauss. Uh, this incredible richness of harmony uh, and this tremendous dramatic moment where we, we ache with Porgy for having lost Bess uh, and, and uh, we hear that in this, this melody. Uh, this piece is one of my favorite pieces from uh, Porgy and Bess because also there are these incredible harmonic changes, uh, a harmonic richness that we only get with this great composer. Coming up, and then we change key again, and again. Right, so we get these incredible uh, harmonic changes and what we call in music modulations. Now I do want to get to the final piece I was planning to talk about, which comes from the movie uh, Shall We Dance, written for Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Uh, it is a, a, a song called They Can't Take That Away From Me, and I'm sure many of you uh, know this song. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, really sad that, that Gershwin, of course, once he wrote the song, he and Ira, Ira wrote the lyrics, wrote the song, the studio took it over and really did what they wanted with it. And it, unlike on Broadway, where the Gershwins had some control over their material, really in Hollywood they did not have that artistic control. And Gershwin and his brother were always upset, and Fred Astaire too, that this song wasn't used very well in the movie. Uh, in fact, uh, you will see that it comes near the end of the film, <laughs> Shall We Dance, and it is... I didn't know getting married was so depressing. I'm sorry, now I ask you. Oh, that's all right. I'll get over it. Oh, God. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, no. Oh, my tomorrow, you're gone. The song is ended, but as the songwriter wrote, the melody lingers on. They may take you from me, I'll miss your fond caress. But though they take you from me, I'll still possess. The way you wear your hat, the way you sip your tea, the memory of all that. Oh no, they can't take that away from me, the way your smile just beams, the way you sing of me.
Well, that's the only time we hear the song in the, in the film. It's such a beautiful song. And yet, uh, uh, Astaire and Rogers were not asked to dance to that song, which is sort of strange, because it is one of the best songs of the show. And so, uh, Astaire and Rogers did two more films in the late 1930s, and then they parted ways. And they uh, did the story of Vernon and Irene Castle in 1939, but then they had other options and they decided, you know, we've done enough films together. Somebody convinced them to come back for one more film uh, and that was The Barclays of Broadway in 1949 and in the uh, movie Barclays of Broadway, this is of course now 12 years after Gershwin had died, Astaire suggested why don't we put They Can't Take That Away From Me into this film. This film is in color and we finally see Fred and Ginger, and there's a sort of poignancy to this because this is the end of their last film. They do dance to this song. So you'll see an interesting um, cut here in this. This is the last time Rogers and Astaire danced together. Well, I wish we could watch more of that. You'll just have to go and watch the Barclays of Broadway on your own. But I really wanted to end with what I find one of the most moving musical performances I have ever heard. Uh, and I apologize because I know we've gone over the hour mark. But I cannot end without playing this piece for you. Uh, I mentioned already on September the 11th, 1937, there was a performance of Gershwin works uh, played in the Hollywood Bowl. You saw those thousands of people who came out to hear some of the great performers of that time play again and sing uh, some of the uh, Gershwin pieces. And it was a wide range of pieces that they played that, at that concert. The concert went on for about two hours. Uh, but one person who wanted to perform at this was, of course, Fred Astaire. Uh, Fred Astaire had been such a close friend of Gershwin for so many years. It was a big shock to Fred Astaire. He just worked on a movie uh, with, with Gershwin, and Shall We Dance had just come out. Uh, and uh, of course, the Gershwin died in July. They set up this concert in September. So it was only about six weeks, I think, since Gershwin's death. And what piece did Fred Astaire want to sing? He wanted to sing They Can't Take That Away From Me. And there's something about the way he sings this song. And of course, then the meaning of the words becomes perhaps even stronger in, in Iris' uh, case, talking about, of course, a love and clearly uh, not necessarily another man, but the... Um, <clears throat> But you feel that, Gersh, um, that Esther can hardly sing. There's a, there's a sense that he's having trouble <laughs> keeping it together. <clears throat> now, I always think the magic of this song lies in the melodic simplicity of the song, the, the fact that so much of this melody is, is one single note, right? In fact, five single notes in a row 
before we move either up or down. Why we finally move up a major third, or or we go down a perfect fourth, and then the next time we hear it, we go up a fifth uh, again, and then of course the tagline. Right, we get the the tagline. Uh, now, of course, the rhythm of that is uh, emphasized by the fact that the orchestra plays the same rhythm as the sustained note of the move, the note that he's moved to, the sun. Right, we get a little echo in the accompaniment of the rhythmic patterning in the voice. <clears throat> I'm not going to play all of this, but a little. You can hear it in his voice. Now listen for the third no when he sings no. This one. Well, we have uh, this tremendous shock that the musical world received when Gershwin died so suddenly at the age of 38. Uh, and I think uh, it was a great loss to the musical world and to the history of American music. But I want to end with this thought. Um, there is so much great music that they can't take away from us. And I believe, as the song says in the verse, uh, the melody lingers on, and the, and the songs and, and melodies of Gershon, I think, are going to stay with us for a very long time. So thank you very much. <laughs>